Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to, let's make it Isaiah 33. Isaiah 33. Isaiah 33. Got a couple of different things I want to kind of share with you tonight. This morning, now I really enjoyed uh, getting to do a little bit of history and giving a little bit on the... Uh, Independence Day and uh, 4th of July and hopefully uh, learned something or was reminded of something and this morning I did leave something out of the message that I wanted to say that I didn't say uh, I wanted to say the only reason that we still have the liberties and freedoms we have today is because of our Constitution and the Second Amendment Amen when we lose our guns, we will lose our freedoms. Why do you think they're after the guns? They're after the guns because they hadn't forgot. Amen? They haven't forgot. That, 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 that's what keeps our government in check. Amen? That's just, the, just, as, just as plain as I can put it. Uh, they take your guns, then we will know what tyranny is. They're talking about we've had tyrants for presidents. We ain't had no tyrants for presidents. We really have, they, they don't have that much control, but I'm telling you, if we allow them to take our guns, we'll, we'll know what one, we'll know what a, a tyrannical government is, amen? Yeah. We'll learn real quick. Now, in Isaiah 33, I don't know why, did you turn there? Wait, oh yeah, here it is, verse 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Now, I'm not looking for government to save me. I'm not looking for government to protect me and provide for me in a spiritual sense. Now, uh, that verse that I gave you is, uh, I'm going to use it twofold. I'm going to give you a spiritual application it's the Lord that's our king. The Lord's our lawgiver. He's the one we're to follow. That is our final authority. Amen? Amen? But our government came from that verse. All three branches of our government came from right there. We have an executive branch, a legislative <laughs> branch, and a judicial branch of the government. We have the president, that's the executive. He's to see that the laws are carried out. We have a legislative branch. There's your Congress. They make the law. They legislate the laws. There's the lawgivers. And then we have the judicial. And they're the ones that judge to make sure whether the laws are constitutional. And that brings me to a point that I want to make. Maybe... Some of you younger ones don't know this or don't understand this, but we are not a democracy. Amen. We are not a democracy. You ask most people at graduating college what form of government we have, and they'll say we're a democracy. Why? Because you get people up there on the news media, and the news media push it as well, but you get people up there, even our congressmen. You know, get up there. Uh, I'll just give you a perfect example. Nancy Pelosi, just last week when Roe versus Wade was turned over, our democracy took a hit this week. Our democracy, our democracy, our democracy. We are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. When Benjamin Franklin and the Continental Congress came out of the, out, of, uh, uh, out of the meeting place where they formed the Constitution, a lady asked him, what form of government did you give us? His response was, a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. I'm going to tell you what the difference between a democracy and a republic is. And then we'll look at just a few random things tonight that, that, that may help you understand some things better. Now, several years ago, I started something. I don't know that I'll continue it. It stopped there when COVID came in, but every July I was preaching patriotic messages, patriotic themes. I would preach on uh, all these different things, 
And I enjoyed that, and I think that needs to be done with a balance. With a balance. Now, I say that, have it, I say that, and I'll explain that. Some churches, when you go in, they're nothing more than a political activist. And it's politics, 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 politics. And in some churches you go in, and it's like they're, they're cowards. They're afraid to say anything that may offend someone or that's not considered political correct. You have those who say politics don't belong in the pulpit, and then you have those that's all they want to hear. Preacher, you need to preach which way to vote. The truth of the matter is, when politics left the pulpit, morality left America. Preachers used to get up and preach against the sins of the leaders and would name them. You talk about calming things down, boy, I tell you what, it'd calm some things down if, if people got their sins broadcast, wouldn't it? Right. Well, not nowadays. They'd brag on it. Nowadays, any publicity, free publicity, is good publicity. It doesn't matter what they do anymore. Clinton proved that. You say, preacher, that's horrible, well, that's terrible. You know exactly what I was thinking when I said it. That's where we're at. But here's the difference. A democracy is the majority rule. The majority rule. You say, well, don't the people, don't the people rule in, a, in America? Isn't it a government for the people, by the people, of the people? Yes and no. We are a republic. Uh, but first, let me give you the definition of democracy. It's majority rule. And I'm going to break it down to you so you understand it. It's mob rule. That's what it always is. They give you the pretty words, majority rule, but it's basically the mob rules. Whoever's the strongest and the loudest can squash the minority. Whoever's the strongest and the loudest can take the rights of the minority. That's why we're a republic. So that the little man can still have his rights retained regardless of what everyone else wants to do. Amen? Now, the majority in a, de in, in a de democracy can trample the rights of minorities. If the majority wants to take guns, then the minority cannot stop them. They are forced to give up their guns. Now, in a republic, it is a, it, a republic is where the officials are elected by the people and they are to represent the people, but they are to govern within parameters set by the Constitution. Therefore, we are a constitutional republic. We do have some democracy about us in that we get to vote for our officials, but our officials, when they lead and govern us, they are bound by predetermined regulations called our Constitution. Our Constitution is to keep the government straight. The Constitution isn't to keep us straight. It's to keep the government from growing into to. Uh, tyranny to keep the government from growing so big that they take over the people. They can't just make any law they want. Although it appears they do. I, I'm going to say something. I said it when Trump was in, so don't you get mad at me when I say it now. When the president sits down and I think Obama's the one who said, I've got a pen, and he could write these presidential mandates and orders. That's not constitutional. The president does not have the constitutional authority given by the people to make laws. He is the executive branch. He's to see that the laws are carried out. He's over the DOJ. He's over the FBI. He is to see that the laws are enforced. He is not to make laws. Just like the justice system, the judiciary system, they don't make laws. Their only job is to see that the laws that are being passed line up with the Constitution. That's a form called checks and balances. They, there's three, and they constantly walk, watch over each other and fuss with each other. The, a little bit of fussing is good. 
Debate is great. You know why? You grow. You get challenged. And, and, and you'll find a solution that everybody can live with. And the big guys don't trample the little guys. There, I'll give you an example. The, uh, how many of you understand the Electoral College? Right? You understand the Electoral College? There's a few hands. A few hands don't go up. Uh, one party wants to do away with the Electoral College. I think the Electoral College is wrong that the president ought to be by the majority vote. Well, no. If you do it by the majority vote, then you have turned into a de <coughs> democracy rather than a republic. Our Constitution had provisions in it to keep the majority from squashing the minority. And here's how it worked. There were 13 colonies, 13, well, 13 states, I should say. 13 states. Some of the states were bigger in population than some of the other states. We're that way now. You go to New York City, boom, New York is just all kinds of people live there. And then you go to Montana, and it's like old western. You expect to hear somebody whistling in the background. Where's everybody at? There goes the tumbleweeds. You know what I'm saying? If the majority wins every time, then guess what? Montana's vote don't matter. So what they do is they go by population. And some states may have two or three electoral votes because their population is big, and then another state may have one. It's to keep California and New York from getting together and deciding who runs this country. The Electoral College is a good thing. It was brilliant, brilliant of our founders to, to get that instituted that way. Amen? They were extremely smart. The people now want to undo it are just extremely crooked. They want to win. Yep, yep. That's why they want rid of it. Okay? When somebody wants rid of a law or do away with a law, you better get to looking at what that law actually is they're trying to get rid of and see why. Amen? But even if the majority wants it, they must abide by the Constitution. That's good. So the question comes up, which is better? A democracy or a republic? Think about it. Would you want to live in a country that was mob ruled? After witnessing some of the stuff we've witnessed over the last several years? Right. With the rise of Antifa and, and, and some of these different groups that are mobs that are looting and burning cities and such as Portland and stuff. Would you want that mob to be the ones deciding the laws? If that's the case, they would have defunded the police, they would have took it, taken our guns, and where would we be? Defenseless. Okay. Amen. Our founding fathers had more sense than that. So when he said a republic, if you can keep it, he understood exactly what he was saying. That we may have to fight for it. Now our fight is not taking up guns, our fight is not going out in the streets and with ball bats. Our fight is in the voting booths, amen? We still control who goes in there. I, I, it just amazes me. I don't know who's the dumbest. Our leaders today or the people that put them in there. Right, amen. Either way, it bothers me. Because like I said, the ones leading today is supposed to be the cream of the crop. The elect of our society. They are supposed to be the pinnacle of of what America can achieve and has to offer intellectually, I mean, they should be they should be superior. And I don't even know if this guy knows where the bathroom is. <laughs> and if he did, would he know which one to go into? That's the day in which we live. That's our leaders. That's our educators. Just like I was telling the other day, well, I, I went and got my hair cut and the uh, uh, lady that was in there with uh, Amanda was talking about, she had heard about some kid wanting a kitty litter box in the school and the school was talking about it. I just got to life and I said, I told her what I told y'all. I said, if, that, if I was a principal or the teacher and the kid demanded a litter box in the bathroom, I'd take that litter box and wear them out. Yeah. 
Send them home and tell her, tell her parents or tell his parents whatever it was. Send it home and tell it when you get home. If your parents don't like it, tell them come back down here. Still got the litter box. Amen. Right. Wear them out with it. Yeah. Amen. 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 Now, when someone asks you or you hear them on TV talking about what form of government we have, you know you're in trouble when they're trying to deceive you and make you think right away that we are a democracy. We're a republic. A constitutional republic. You know, it's sad, but these are our senators and leaders that are just trying to deceive us. Our leaders are lying and trying to deceive us. That ought to bother us greatly. And I'm telling you, they're doing it on both sides. But I will say this. One side wants it more than the other. I may get there in a minute, but let's, uh, let's go on to something else. Now, I've hit the three branches of government. I remember talking about law, liberty, and the Lord. And I had an overhead projector, and I showed the, the, the three branches of the government, how it works and everything. It should be on tape somewhere. I, I believe that was the title of it. If you want more information on that, I spent a whole service on just that issue. But I want to talk a little bit now about something else. It ain't as big an issue now as it was, but it's still just as important as it ever has been. I want to talk about our flag. Have you ever been to a ball game or been to an event of some kind of special event where they ask everybody to rise and they play the Star Spangled Banner and you see people stand up they turn and square up to our flag and put their hand over their heart. That's in respect. Right. That's respect. Have you ever been to one of those events where they refuse to stand? Where they, could, where they stay seated? Where they will not take their hats off? A sign of respect? Where they, where, where they continue talking with their friend or on a phone or get up and go to the bathroom or go to the concession stand. That's disrespect for our flag. Right. And the reason most people disrespect the flag is because they don't understand what that flag actually represents. That flag in the Declaration of Independence go hand in hand. Once this nation declared independence, we needed something to unite the people under. There was something needed. Uh, and George Washington went to Betty Ross. This is the story of our flag. And legend holds that Washington went and he, he, he took a pencil and sketched out a flag that he wanted her to sew. And his original star had six points. And it said that she showed him how she could fold cloth and with one cut, make a five-pointed star, and he accepted it. He approved it. Then June 14th, 1777, the Second Continental Congress passed the Flag Resolution, which accepted the red, white, and blue flag. And it was under that flag that our freedom was won. It was under that flag that men gave their life, gave their fortunes, gave their all so that we could have freedom. So that we could have freedom. Now, the original flag had the 13 stripes, red representing blood, of course, the right, the righteousness for which we are to stand, and the blue for heaven. Each star stood for each state. There were 13 originally. The 13 stripes is for the 13 states. Amen. That's what they were, that's why they were there. The 13 colonies represented there. Now, a new star is added each time a new state is added uh, to the blue field on the flag. The blue representing, of course, heaven. The, and we believe that we are in the promised land and believe that the Lord guided us 
where we are, our, through our forefathers, he guided us to this place. Now, America, again, flew the flag as they fought for independence. And the last star added, the 50th star added to our flag is when Hawaii became a state back in 1959. Now, for those of you that want a little bit more on the stars on our flag, I will recommend you go to the internet, look up my Daniel study, get in Daniel chapter 7, and I'll show you there's going to be two more stars added before, before it's over with. There's going to be 52. It's going to be divisible by 13. Rebellion. You mark it down. It is book. It's amazing. And you know what they're talking about in Congress from time to time? Puerto Rico wants to become a state or, 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 or they want Washington, D.C. to become a state. California's actually been talking about splitting and becoming two states. Before it's over with, there'll be two more stars added to that flag. You watch and see. But anyway, the flag flew as men gave their life for the freedom we enjoy today. Now, the battle, the, the war for independence, the Revolutionary War, it was truly a David versus Goliath situation. Britain was the, had the strongest navy there was. They had fleets of ships and war vessels. They were wealthy. They had been taxing America. America was struggling financially. They would have been struggling. They were farmers. They were industrialized nation compared to America. When, those, when they came over, they sent armies over. And farmers fought armies. They were the Davids fighting the Goliath of Great Britain. Amen. And they thought they would utterly humiliate those farmers. They didn't succeed. We understand that now. And when they lost, they were so humiliated, they just, they just bided their time. Here's one most people don't think about. Have you ever heard of the War of 1812? The War of 1812 is sometimes called the Second War of Independence because Britain, humiliated by the fact they had been beaten by colonies, by farmers, by uneducated, by America, they were humiliated. They seen an opportunity where they thought they could defeat America. So they invaded and they captured Washington, D.C. Most of you may not know this, but August 24th, 1814, they burned many of the buildings in Washington, D.C., including the White House. The White House has went through a burning. It has been burned. Then they moved on. They moved toward Baltimore, which was the third largest population at that time. It was protected by a place called Fort McHenry. Fort McHenry uh, is located like on a peninsula, and they were protecting, of course, Baltimore. And the British came in, and they had, they had captured, the war had been going on for a little while, and they had captured some people, and we had captured some people. They were captures, uh, captive prisoners on both sides, and... And the British had taken one of the American of one of the Americans, a prominent, well-connected doctor by the name of Dr. Beans. The Americans wanted him back. So they sent people in to try to work out a prisoner exchange. And among those was a man by the name of Francis Scott Keyes. And while Francis Scott Keyes was on the ship and they had he was a lawyer, and while he was on the ship, they had worked out negotiations, had been reached for a one-to-one -one exchange. They were going to exchange prisoners, and 
all the prisoners was held in one of their ships off the coast where they couldn't, you know, far enough out where they couldn't be reached very easily. And as he came up, he went down into the ship to tell the prisoners that they were going to be freed. And when he come up, one of the British officers informed him that he intended to keep his promise, but he was going to have to detain them. Orders had come in. They were to attack Fort Henry. In fear that their plans had been overheard by prisoners, they had to wait till the assault was over. So here is our men on a ship that is attacking our people. And they were watching the assault. The British were stronger. The British were more advanced. The British had weapons that could reach the fort where the fort could not reach them. Francis Scott Keyes would plead for the lives of women and children in and near the fort. And the British gave him a uh, an opportunity to surrender and lower the flag or be attacked. They refused to surrender. The British Navy attacked. And once they attacked, the assault lasted for 25 hours. 25 hours, naval ships with cannons and rockets attacking Fort McHenry. One hour would pass, then two, then three, then four. Do you understand what damage could be done in 25 hours of continuous bombardment? In the twilight of the evening, the flag was seen as it flew. Darkness fell as rains began to fall. And then with the descending bombs and the explosions from the glare of the light, they could still see the flag waving through the night. Many times Francis Key would go down and report what was going on to the prisoners. And through the night, he was asked several times, is the flag still there? Is the flag still there? At one point in the night, it was reported that all the British ships were ordered to bring down that flag. Bring down that flag. See, that flag is more than just a piece of cloth. That flag is more than just fabric. That flag represents something larger. It represented someone willing to give all for freedom. It represented something. And to lower it would have been defeat for America, defeat for freedom. And we would be Drinking hot tea instead of iced tea right now. Amen. They reported several direct hits on the flag. Yet as the sun rose and the smoke and the haze began to clear, there stood old Glory waving. She was tattered. She was torn. Yet she still flew. It was at a strange angle. But it was our flag. She was still flying. The unmerciful barrage, the unequal assault on that flag could not bring it down. The men aboard the ship would ask about that flag all through the night if it was still there and pray, oh God, protect that flag and keep her flying. Men already captured, men whose fate was going to be life in prison, possible uh, treason and hanging their deaths were praying Lord 
don't let them surrender. Had they lowered the flag, they would have released the prisoners, they would have been fired. But the prisoners were praying, Lord, protect that flag. Keep that flag flying. When they were allowed to leave, Francis Scott Keyes was allowed to leave the ship. He boarded a small rowboat, went ashore, and saw something that moved him so that he took pen and paper and wrote the words we know today as the Star Spangled Banner. It was a poem, which later was set to music and later became our national anthem from this event that I'm talking about. What did he see? What did he see that so moved him? He saw a shredded flag that had been hit several times and a pile of bodies at the base of the flag. When the flag was hit and knocked down, men willingly ran out to stand it back up. Knowing that was the center point, that was the bull's eye for Britain. Knowing it meant possibly their life. And as they were killed, another would take his place to hold that flag up. And another. And again. And again. 25 hours through the dark night through the explosions in the rain they gave their life so that flag could fly these were husbands these were fathers these were men who willingly gave up their life for that flag because of what it stood for. Because they wanted you and I to have liberty and freedom. That's what they gave their lives for. The war ended a few months later. Britain again defeated. Humiliated before the world. And the, the, the reason I get so upset and tore up when I see people disrespect the flag is because I know how ignorant they are. And it bothers me to know that someone in America could spit, walk on, stomp, burn, kneel, rather than stand in respect for that flag. Amen. Knowing the cost, Amen. knowing the sacrifice that people gave because of what she represents, I'm not going to kneel before a piece of cloth, but I'll kneel before the red, white, and blue as far as respect. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to humble myself before that. I'll give it the respect it deserves. Amen. Now, used to be kneel like you kneel before the king was a sign of respect. You stand in honor. Like when a woman comes in the room. Men used to stand in honor. Now they don't even pay attention. There's a difference. There's a difference today than what there used to be. The reason I get upset at these fools, these idiots, these spook brats that are, are taking the liberty those men gave them to spit on their grave. When they burn a flag, they are spitting on the grave and in the blood of those that gave their life so they could have the freedom to do it. They disrespect the families that sacrificed husband, father, sons, so that they could have that freedom. Fools. That flag has traveled around the world. It has sailed every ocean. It has climbed every mountain. And it has been in outer space. It has draped the coffins of the greatest men and women God put on this earth who gave their lives defending 
freedoms of others. It has been folded and handed to families that have suffered the loss of a loved one as a reminder of what that sacrifice was for. Freedom and liberty. Today we live in a bunch of ignorant, spoiled fools that has no respect for the flag. In fact, we have a country full of educated fools who talk bad about our country. They have no respect for our laws, our God. They have no respect for any of that. And I just want to say this. If you don't like our flag, if you don't respect our way of life, leave. Amen. Amen. Nothing's Amen. holding you here. Last I heard, the border's open. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Just pack your suitcase and leave. If it's that bad and you don't like it, just pack your bags and get out. Just, just, just shut up, quit complaining, and leave. Do something, amen? Just leave. It's that simple. Go to Mexico. Spit on their flag. Burn their flag in the street. Disrespect their way of life. And see how well you fare in a country that does not have the freedoms that flag represents. If America is so bad, let me ask you a question. Why is it that everybody comes here? Why is it that everybody strives to come here? Why is it that a man will risk the safety of his family and march across another country just to get to our border and a chance to get in if America is so bad. Why does the whole world want to live here? Mm. I don't care if you're a millionaire fool that wears a football helmet and you kneel, you need to leave. I don't care if you're a movie star, TV star that makes millions and the world laughs at you and thinks you're funny and you're a comedian. Uh, uh, what was her name? Roseanne Barr, I believe was her name. They should have kicked her off TV. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Right. Mocking the national anthem, grabbing her crotch, spitting, slaughtering the national anthem like it was a joke. She should have been booed out of the stadium. She should have been kicked off TV. She has no right being uh, uh, any kind of example to anyone. Now here's what I want to give you. For a lead. I, I've told you about a few of the people that, that will attack our Bible, that will attack the freedoms that we have, that will attack our Constitution even. But now I'm going to give you some and I'm just going to go ahead and name them. Amen. And I, I'm not going to name them so much as far as, you know, Clinton, Obama or anything like that or, or, or Bushes or anything like that. I'm just going to give you a, a good guideline. The ones that are attacking that flag, our liberties, our freedoms are liberals. You do not hear of conservatives not kneeling for the flag, burning the flag. It's always the liberals. It's always the liberals. Uh, it's always a liberal affiliated group. Black Panthers, Antifa, those that follow uh, the, the liberal agenda. Those are the ones that are attacking it openly. It's the college kids who have been brainwashed. I'll say it again. Who have been brainwashed rather than educated and taught to think for themselves. They've been brainwashed into hating the very country, the very country that they were born in and the, the greatest country on the earth. Amen. 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 Have they been brainwashed by liberal teachers and professors? Liberal agenda. Liberals who hate our government, hate our constitution, who wants to be a democracy or a socialist country. They hate the constitution.
trying to see what I can put in, what I can leave out. I've got a bunch of Bible verses here, but I'm not going to start turning my Bible. But I do want to tell you that, that our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, came from this. And our forefathers believed in God and divine providence led them led them to the War of Independence. Led them. I believe it was uh, during the Constitution, when the Constitution was being written, they come to a point where there was debate. Because, see, there was, there was a lot of stuff in there. They, 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 they struggled, amen? They were libertarians then, too, is what they called them then. Those loyalists that were still loyal to the Britain and the English way of doing things, they still fought it, and they were having debates, and when they'd come to a dead step, uh, like a dead end, they couldn't go any further. Uh, I believe it was Ben Franklin who, who called the men together and reminded them that God does intervene in the affairs of men and that they ought to pray. And our forefathers, Continental Congress, that would be our congressmen, got together in a prayer meeting seeking divine guidance and wisdom and then got back up and finished the debate after praying together. That's what we need. We need men of character. Could you imagine that? They're be praying, oh God, kill them. That's what they're praying up there now. Oh God, vote them out. That's the kind of stuff they're voting for now. They're not voting for wisdom and what's best for the country. They're voting for what's best for their constituents, what's best for their uh, donors, what's best for their pocketbook, what's best for their family. Then men and women left their farms and their businesses and went to Washington. They served their terms. They served their country. Then they came back to their farms, back to their businesses, and spent time with their family and, 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 and reassumed building their wealth for their families. Now they go into Washington to enrich their families. Now instead of it being serving your country for a term, it has become serving your country in, for a life tenure just about. How long has Nancy Pelosi been there? She, she's been there ever since Noah died, I think. <laughs> it's time for some of them to go. Right. They're up there so long, they learn all the loopholes, they learn how to get away with murder, they learn how to get rich, they learn how to get around this and that, and they turn dirty. I... I think when the congressmen first go in there, they're humble. They're overwhelmed at the, in awe at the responsibility that's been placed in their hands. And those people that have been up there a long time starts working on them. And starts offering them money. And starts showing them money. Listen, if you want to know whether or not we're, we're being taxed too much, think about the billions that they give other countries millions at a time, billions at a time to give to other countries. Right. I think they're overtaxing us if they can afford to do that. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we're a debtor nation. We need to be paying our bills. Amen. I don't know how you run your house, but when I've got a bill, I want to get it paid. We keep going further and further in debt and it's one of these days they're going to call it another. There's nothing left but land. Because the silver and gold has gone. 1913, they did away with the gold standard. If you rob Fort Knox, you might just be getting dust. There's nothing to back our money anymore. The Federal Reserve is a privately owned bank. They gave it the name Federal Reserve to fool the people into thinking that it was federally owned and run. No. That's a private bank. Boy, that's something to think about right there, ain't it? Right. 
Who gave them that power? Where does that come from? I'm telling you, we need to start paying more attention to our leaders. And you say, preacher, I don't like this. I don't think that's wrong. You know what? Ahab was a wicked king and Elisha's day he went up and he called him out on it and he said it wasn't going to rain. Boy, I wish I had power to keep it from raining. I'd let it rain in my house, but y'all couldn't have none. <laughs> and it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but, but you see what I'm saying? They called out the kings. you remember? John the Baptist, what did he do? He went into there and he said, it's not lawful for thee to have that woman for your wife. Call that a sin publicly. Cost him his head. But he did it. Elijah and those are examples that we're to follow. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, people don't like talking about religion and politics. But you know what we need to be talking about? Religion and politics. We've allowed the naysayers, the thin-skinned sissies, oh, it offends me. Get on a boat and get out. Right, but we need to talk about some things and we need, to, we need to get some things right. Amen? Thank God they finally got one of them set right. right. When they overturned Roe versus Way, all they did was fix a mistake 50, from 50 years ago. Right. Right. They did wrong back then and they're just now getting it right. It took them 50 years to get the thing right. How many lives lost? And then these women marching in the streets crying and, oh, women's rights. Nancy Pelosi, our democracy has taken a grave hit this, this time. And oh, how terrible it is. They're, 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 they have a coordinated attack to tear down women's health. Abortion is not women's health. That's right. Has nothing to do with it. Planned Parenthood is nothing but a Murder meal. Right. You say, well, I know a lot of women that go there and they get such and such done. They can get that done at the clinic. They can get that done at, at, at different hospitals in different places. That, that, but they get it free at Planned Parenthood. They get it free there! Other places. Right. And they always say, well, what about different issues such as rape and incest? They can stop the conception. There's a day after pill. There's things that can be done to stop the conception. You say, preacher, I don't like this kind of talk. Hey, listen, it don't matter if you like this kind of talk. We need some common sense in here. We need common sense back in society today where people aren't being fooled by pretty speeches. Right. I have to admit, you listen to some of these and it sounds like the Republicans hate women and they want to destroy y'all. But that's not the truth. And if you're wondering, I'm not a Republican. I'm independent. I'm Christian and vote accordingly. I don't know that we'll ever turn America. I know you turn on the TV and they're talking about a great revival. I'm not looking for a great revival. I'm looking for a falling away. I'm seeing the falling away, but it, it causes my heart to fear. Why? Because just like our forefathers, I'm looking ahead and I don't like seeing what my children and grandchildren are going to have to go through. In my lifetime, 51 years, still young man, wet behind the ears, I know. <laughs> Amen. Still, I'm amazed at what changes I've seen. I'm amazed. We have, in my short life, as an adult, as an adult, you take half of that, and you take in the last 25 years, we've basically watched the homosexuals come out of the closet, get laws passed to protect them, get, get unconstitutional laws saying that they can get married. Right. Yep. Right. I mean, unbiblical, unholy, unjust. You say, well, listen, you might be a tree hugging, queer loving, I don't care. 
I'm going to go by what the book says. Amen. 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 And that's what blessed this country. That's what made this country great. That's why the whole world envies this country. That's why this country is truly a land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. I know it's not the Canaan land, but I'm telling you, it's a picture of it. But America is in trouble. That a nation turns its back on God is in trouble. And all America needs to do is look to the Bible. Israel is the apple of God's eye. They're called God's people. And if God judged them for their wickedness, for turning their back on Him, for turning away from His Word, if He judged them so harshly that they were bullying their own babies to eat. You think we've seen hard times with the pandemic and had, you know, we had to stay home for three weeks? You know what I mean? We ain't seen nothing. He was quoting some numbers this morning. I don't remember exactly what he was talking about, but about the millions that died in the first couple wars and talked about how we don't know nothing. And we don't. That pandemic was horrible. Many have died, yes. But it's nothing compared to what's coming. When the rapture takes place, God's going to wipe out one-third the population within just a short time. Seven billion people on the planet. Seven billion with a B. Take one-third of that. Let's just say two billion people going in, say, three months. There's no way you can bury that many bodies fast enough. And that's not the end. He's going to take another third or quarter. Before it's over with, there's only going to be a third of the population left. I believe we're witnessing the falling away. I believe that a lot of what I preach and what I've been pointing out that preaching against is just evident that people are falling away from God. If you're here lost, I'd get saved. Because you don't have a clue what's coming. We can't even comprehend the horror of what's coming in the tribulation. And if you've heard the gospel and had a chance to get saved and you're not saved, you will be deceived. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God himself will send strong delusion that you believe a lie. You'll accept whatever the Antichrist says. You'll accept the mark and you'll perish in that tribulation period. That's just straight book. We need more time in the book. Amen. Amen. Father, I do want to thank you, Lord. I know I was scattered.